Hello, my name is Jacob, and I'm a Norse pagan, and I'm in Ian's car right now, and we're traveling to the Himskomps. What the fuck do you say this again? Yumskomps Center? Yumskomps? Something, yeah, along those lines, I don't know. Yumskomps. I don't know, I'm putting it on the screen, maybe you can pronounce it. Hopefully we'll learn when we get there. <laughs> but I'm in Minnesota right now, and I'm with Ian, so he's from the Folk Podcast, if you watch that. Uh, so that's his beautiful and ugly face all at the same time. The luscious beard. Yeah, he's finally, finally yeah, it's, well, he's got a neck beard going on, too. It's kind of gross. Um, <laughs> so up here in Minnesota, there is a Viking longship that was created in the 1980s that actually sailed to Norway and came back. And then where it, it ported is actually built a museum around it where they actually have a stave church that has been recreated as well. Um, so we're actually getting kind of a private tour. We're going to get a lot of information. So we're going to be talking about that. But also I want to talk about Vikings in America. Obviously a lot of us know about Leif Erikson, but there's some more things I want to mention to really explore how far the Vikings actually made it here in the United States and within North America, um, which is one of the reasons I think Norse paganism is really popular here as well. So without further ado, we're going to finish this road trip here and see the Yum Comps Center. Close enough. Yeah. <laughs> So the story of this Viking ship is quite an interesting one and really worthy of a saga type tailing and which is why this museum exists in the first place. So the person that actually came up with this idea, his name was Robert Ass or Bob Ass. While in the hospital with an injury, he actually read these books that his friends brought him on how to actually build this ship and he came up with a dream of doing it. Now originally it seems like he thought it wasn't going to take that long and he thought it was going to take a couple of years and a few planks of wood, but this ended up being a 10 year long project that ended up taking up a um, hundred different oak trees to build. I mean this thing is absolutely massive. And so he built this ship. He was also inspired by a Viking ship that he saw at the World Fair in Chicago. Now the World Fair was in the late 1890s, but the ship that they built and actually sailed from Norway to Chicago was still in Chicago at the time, so him and his family saw it, and it was really inspiring for him. Now this ship is actually based on a find in Oslo, Norway, which is the Gokstad ship, and that was used to travel across long distances. So that design is basically what this ship looks like. Now there are a few modern conveniences in here, so when they actually sailed across the ocean, they did have a radio in here um, and other things like that, but for the most part, this was made as close to possible as a Viking era ship. So the entire idea was to build this over the course of a few years, and then Bob and his family would end up taking this across the ocean to Norway, very similar to how they did in the Chicago World Fair. Sadly, halfway through its construction, Bob was diagnosed with leukemia and never actually got to see that voyage. He did end up taking this out on Lake Superior and did get to take the maiden voyage. Uh, sadly, he did end up passing away before it was completed. But there was so much um, excitement about this and so much community behind it, the community and the family ended up banding together, finishing the project and setting sail. The entire journey took about 70 days and it was about 34 days on the North Atlantic Ocean because they had to sail from Duluth, Minnesota, all the way through uh, the, basically all the Great Lakes, and eventually through New York City and then out into the North Atlantic. Now, when they did this in 1982, it did get a lot of press. And this is why I'm really excited to share with you now because this is almost 40 years ago, which is crazy. And I'm sure many people don't know this story. And it's definitely a story that's worthy of being told because a man had a dream about you know recovering his heritage, uh, discovering it and building it into life and then sailing it across the ocean just like his ancestors did. And that is a really impressive and admirable tale that I think is worthy of being shared still today. Um, so I really hope you enjoy the ship and everything I'm showing you um, because it is a really a beautiful piece of work and I mean just the amount of effort it took not only to build it but also to sail it across the ocean. Um, I mean all the pictures that are through here all show like the celebration that was held um, and just how excited Norway was and the Norwegians didn't actually think he was going to be able to do it or they didn't think the people were going to be able to sail across the ocean um, and you know just to see that congratulations uh, all the boats and excitement that was about this 40 years ago really truly incredible.
This Stav church was built much later after the Yumcom Center was added. This was actually built in 1998 by a guy named Guy Paulson, who was a wood carver known for a lot of really famous works and known really well for his skill. And this was his retirement project. The reason that Guy Paulson chose this area is because 50% of the population in this county considers themselves to have Scandinavian heritage. And so he thought that adding something like this here would really be show itself as a symbol of the heritage of the people here. And the fact that there was a long ship already here definitely added to that as well. And it sounds like he literally just contacted contacted um, the Yumscum Center and said, hey, can I build a stop church in your backyard? And they said, sure, of course. And he ended up funding this completely by himself. And he had a lot of help building it, but a lot of the more intricate details he chose to carve by hand using the original tools. And I think that's pretty darn amazing. The thing that I really love about the original church that this was based off is the fact that it was built in the 1100s, which means it was really close to the pagan era or the Viking age. That means all the stylistic choices are probably really similar to how they would have been for halls or other possible temples. I mean, we know about the temple of Uppsala in Sweden, and this may have been a very similar style. Now, of course, there would have been small minor differences throughout history. And the main thing that the tour guide brought up for the stave church that I actually really appreciated is the fact that the reason they built this so tall was to show the imposing power of God. So really, if you take this building and the stylistic choices and shrink it down, I think you really would have a building that would be quite similar to a pagan temple if it would have existed during this time. One thing that I really appreciated about the tour guide is she didn't mention the fact that there was paganism at this time and this was the conversion era and it wasn't in a negative way. It, it was in a very factual way. So I really appreciate that about the tour. Um, but the thing that was mentioned here that I absolutely love, this carving was done by the creator of this stop church and um, it is two scale and two ratio. Um, it took several months to do of the actual front of the building in Norway. And the depiction is thought to represent the conversion of Norway into Scandinavia and the conflict of the deities that came with it. So what you have is down here is the lion head sending out vines and trapping things such as dragons and boats and other symbols of the Norse pagan era or the you know pre-Christian Scandinavian you know Neolithic religion, whatever you want to call it. The old ways were being taken over by Christianity. And I think that's really cool to see this on the front here. Obviously, when we go inside, it's very Christian in there, but that doesn't change the fact that this is a you know, representation of what could have been in the past and what can still be in the future. So obviously inside of the Stave Church is probably where we see the most changes from the pagan to the Christian because this was made to honor God. Uh, I mean, literally there is a giant like altar thing right here to Jesus. But they did say this was added later and most likely wasn't in the original construction. What I really want to focus on, at least in here, is the fact that they didn't use nails for any of this, which is absolutely incredible. Like I said outside, even though this is a Christian church, this was made so close to the end of the Viking Age and the end of the pagan era that a lot of the things we see in here are probably very similar to what we would have seen within um, halls or hofs and maybe even temples that they did exist at the time. Um, so even a temple like Uppsala, may have actually looked like this to some regard. Now, again, we can't say to how, to how much it was, but we can say for certain that it would have been very similar to this. And obviously, you know, Ian and I are thinking about like building a hall. It's like, uh... <laughs> yeah, this, our standards are set pretty high. Right, right yeah, yeah. Using metal uh, utilities, but... Yeah, I mean, obviously, um, you know, less, less crosses and, and Jesus, but at the same time, going for something like this is definitely what we would, I would say we would definitely want to go for. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Vikings are not something I talk about very often in this channel just because it's not something that really pertains to my practice as it stands now. I mostly look to Bronze Age, nor Neolithic paganism and things like that. But that doesn't change the fact that yes, Vikings are pretty cool and what they did is pretty cool as well. And obviously, you know, people doing things like this, building the stop church out in the back, they're interested in this as well. So as far as Vikings in America, well, a lot of people know about Leif Erikson. People know that he came here around 1000 CE um, and was the first European to set foot in North America but a lot of people don't know there is a disconnection between the Viking settlement that we found in Newfoundland 
and Leif Erikson. We don't actually know for certain if that's the same settlement he established. We can only assume that just based on the region that it was. Um, so we do know that Leif Erikson, according to the sagas of the Icelanders, um, sailed to explore the western part of the ocean all the way to Greenland and then eventually all the way down to what he called Vinland. Um, we know that there was a settlement there for about 20 or 30 years and then it kind of vanished. Now, there isn't exactly a known reason for why it vanished. Now, one theory, of course, is that the natives actually did kick them out. There is evidence that there was at least some form of conflict. They even have found an arrowhead inside of the village, inside of like a piece of wood. And so there is a chance that the natives did kick them out. But from one way or another, the, um, the Icelandic settlers did eventually move on. There is a mentioning that they did have a secondary base to the south of their main camp in the Saga of the Icelanders, um, and no one has actually been able to find that secondary base. This seems to be the most information that people typically know about Vikings in North America, and that's because this is the only concrete evidence we really have. There's a lot of unconfirmed evidence that they made it much further and it seems like every year there is a little bit more information found in fact it's actually really hard to find this and i was having a lot of trouble researching it as well so one thing i found is that they actually found a viking age reliquary with like 180 artifacts near lake ontario but i could not find out any more about that so i can't come to this video and say without a doubt yes they were in Ont lake ontario but we also have so much more to suggest they made it much much further there was another story about a man named Thorvald Eriksson who made it, may have made it as far as New Hampshire because within his story it actually shares that he was shot and killed by a Native American and that they buried him here in North America somewhere but no one's been able to find that grave and it's been a little bit of a treasure hunt to see if anyone can find it and some people believe that they did find Viking runes to actually signify his grave in New Hampshire but again it's not something that can be confirmed. Um, there's another account of a strange rock in, um, I believe it was Maine or Vermont, that is very similar to um, Viking Neolithic style drawings. And so that also might be evidence, but again, it's inconclusive. And then there's the rune stones across America, and each of these is a really weird kind of story. So there's the one here in Minnesota um, that has been claimed to be a hoax and someone carved it themselves, but it did create quite the buzz in the early 1900s. And then in Oklahoma, there was in the 1930s and 1960s, two or three more rune stones found that once again are inconclusive as evidence because they can't prove that they were made in the Viking Age and how they got there. And for the most part, they've been labeled as someone just carving runes. But at the same time, it's still very odd that these rune stones were found in around the 1900s. And you know, that tied with the fact that they may have made it further down the coast. And of course, the moment Vikings would have found the river system, they would have made it quite far. All of this evidence put together has really made me believe that the Vikings made it much further than is accepted by you know common society and accepted by common knowledge. And yes, a lot of it can't be proven, but all of this put together really make it seem like the Vikings made it much further than originally thought. Now, as we come to the end of this video, I do want to share that if you are interested, I'm going to leave a link down below. Um, everyone here at the, uh, this facility has been really nice about sharing everything with us, um, giving us information and letting us film here. And so if you want to help out the Yumskov Center, please think about donating to them. Uh, normally, I'm talking about donating to Patreon, but not today. Please think about helping the center so they can get renovated. This is an older building. It hasn't been renovated in some time. And like I said, I do think stories like this are still important to maintain. So definitely, if you can, please help out the center in helping them um, restore and keep up this facility, but also think about coming to visit yourself. It's definitely worth the journey, both for the ship and for the Stav Church out back. So Ian, I was gonna ask you, like, how is it going back now that it's been like, 25 years <laughs> oh man yeah so just for context for people i haven't been to that museum specifically since i was i younger than 10 for sure so it's been a solid 20 plus years since i've been there and going back now i really didn't know what to expect just because i almost had no memory of the place essentially and looking at everything and kind of just having that appreciation for the just the area and the heritage there and then looking at it from a pagan perspective it was honestly it was a little emotional uh there was a the part where they have a theater kind of showing uh they have a video showing of the whole process and telling the story of it and watching it 
you know, and just talking, listening to the individuals that sailed that ship talk about it. And then being people from the area that I was, you know, born and raised in, uh, was, it was kind of a lot. It was a bit emotional for me to some degree. Oh, Jacob's got the goodies. Yeah, I So what he just said reminded me, I bought this cup. It just says, uh, I support local history, and it's got, like, the uh, the actual center on there. And that's honestly, like, something that, you know, I've been kind of attached to a lot uh, recently is, um, especially when I talk about wandering, it's like, don't be afraid to wander around you. You might think that it's just your hometown, or, oh, I've been in this state or this region forever. It's not that exciting. But, like, we were just an hour away from where he's living right now, and, like, not too far away from where he's, like, spent his whole life. And here we are finding something like really cool. Um, and I think every region has that kind of stuff. And I think you'd be really impressed what it, what it really means to see the stories of the people who aren't gonna be remembered in the big history books, but the people that are remembered in the little history books. Yeah, I, yeah, I guess another thing, you know, when I moved back up here to Minnesota, one thing that I told myself is that I wanted to explore more and go to places that I know are around here that I just never went in my younger years. Um, and be able to go there and appreciate them with a different you know, mindset and just, just to go to appreciate them, especially if it's places I haven't been to before. So yeah, this was definitely that first step in my process now with returning back to this area. So the thing I want to leave this video on is something Ian and I were talking about um, afterwards. And this guy that did this, this Bob Ask, you know, he wasn't a pagan. I guarantee you he wasn't. Maybe he never even thought about the pagan element of what he was doing. Um, but he was really just looking to connect to his heritage, that Viking ancestry, but to do something and, and to seek a dream. And that's something that documentary Ian was mentioning that they, they talked about a lot. It's like this guy had a wild dream that everyone thought he was crazy. And not only was he able to realize it, but he got a community to come around him and support this crazy dream. And not just a community in Minnesota, but people all around the Great Lake region, people across the you know the United States, like at least the northern part of it, and people in Norway really cherish this adventure. And so something that happened nearly 40 years ago now, um, you know, something that is slowly fading away into history, this is this guy's saga. And the, the crazy thing is this guy didn't even get to live to see the final end, but he's still part of the story. And at the end of the day, we're really all just trying to like get written down in the small history books in some way. Um, so trust me, get out there, find that local history, um, or, you know, in my case, travel a thousand miles to the middle of nowhere <laughs> Minnesota and find that history that's so far away. But I did think this was really cool to share with you the Viking history of, you know, the Vikings in the United States and the theories and everything around that. Um, not to mention just like the local history here in Minnesota where many people look to that Scandinavian heritage. But thank you so much for joining us for this video and this road trip. Um, so until the hall, until the stave church. Hey. Skull. Skull.